Good morning. It's really a truly an honor to be here today to talk to you um, about my career journey and uh, to give you some advice on my experience, um, both as a, as a first generation Mexican American woman academic scientist, but also as an advocate for enhancing um, inclusivity and diversity uh, in science. So I'm gonna tell you about my early career, uh, my career trajectory, being a professor and experience in leading institutional culture change. So first, let me tell you about who I am and where I come from. I was born in the Central Valley in, in California to a family of Mexican migrant farm workers. My grandmother immigrated from Mexico to the US at the Mexicali border sometime around 1920. She never had the opportunity to learn to read or write and her native language was Spanish. She did not speak English. My mother was born in King City, California, and her first language was Spanish. After elementary school, she also went to work in the fields with her family, and later in life, she worked in the canneries and then as a janitor. She worked almost her entire life. I was born in 1964, the year the Civil Rights Act was signed into law, abolishing racial, racial segregation in the US. I'm the youngest of five children, raised by my mother alone, I guess you would call that a single family home, and we were poor. I grew up in Stockton, California, on the east side, okay? As a child, I worked on the weekends with my family in the fields. And as a teenager, I worked in the packing sheds uh, during the summer. I remember very vividly hardworking people, young and old, and the heat, I remember a raid by La Migra, or ICE, and the inhumane treatment of workers. I remember the smell of fertile peat dirt, ripe tomatoes, the cold, the fog, the drizzle, the warmth of the, of the sun, and the warm bean burritos that my mother would pack for lunch. These experiences are emblazoned in my memory. As a young child, I vividly remember going with my mother to a farm worker rally where Cesar Chavez spoke. Cesar Chavez is an iconic Mexican-American civil rights activist, and Dolores Huerta, also from Stockton, spent their lives working for the rights and protection of farm workers. I remember the, feet, the sound of feet stomping and the shouts of Viva la Huelga and the feelings of belonging, but not really knowing what it all meant. These early experiences are an integral part of who I am. They opened my eyes and taught me a lot about the unjust treatment and exploitation of the most vulnerable people, and that was a long time ago. But you know, injustices and inequitable treatment exist today. But they exist in new forms, like systemic structural racism and sexism. But they serve the same purpose, and that is to exclude people from certain groups from participating. But make no mistake, we will not be excluded, we will not be deterred from pursuing our dreams, including our pursuit of science and changing the system. Nothing will stop us. Okay, so let's fast forward to 2023 and talk about science. We are in an extraordinary era of science. The pace of scientific discovery and innovation is unprecedented and will redefine the way we live, work, and connect to the world. A few notable recent uh, breakthroughs include AI prediction, a protein structure, synthetic chemistry and biology, single cell omics, sustainable fertilizers, nuclear fusion, and medicine, limb regeneration, and particularly RNA therapeutics, a recent example being the rapid development of the COVID-19 vaccine, and also space exploration. Now we are all familiar with the awe-inspiring, incredible photos from the James Webb Space Tel Telescope. This is the most powerful telescope ever created. But do you know about Jose M. Hernandez, the first Mexican-American astronaut, son of migrant farm workers, was born in French camp and raised in Stockton, my hometown. Jose broke barriers. He was a crew member of the space shuttle mission STS-128, and in orbit, Jose was the first person 
to uh, tweet in Spanish. So you can mark that off your list of first, okay? <laughs> There's also a new movie about him called A Million Miles Away. You should check it out. So scientific discoveries are linked to innovation and the diversity of the scientific workforce is critical for innovation. Let me, let me say that again. The diversity of the scientific workforce is absolutely critical for innovation in science. And diversity in science means cultivating the talent and promoting the full inclusion of across the social spectrum, including people from racial and ethnic backgrounds that have been historically underrepresented. And you know who I'm talking about. The lack of inclusion in STEM is a threat to the advancement of science. We must continue to break down barriers and dismantle exclusionary practices to enhance the scientific workforce. In the US, one in five Americans identify as Latino. That's 20% of the population. And individuals of Mexican ancestry are the, are the vast majority, including 62% of all Latinos. Yet, we are woefully underrepresented in STEM. At the faculty level, we are at most one to two percent, and for Latina faculty, we're almost invisible. Less than one percent of all faculty, significantly less than seven percent of our representation in the U.S. population. So to address this issue, a group of 16 Latina, uh, Latinas from STEM across the U.S. met to identify some of these ma uh, major challenges and to um, come up with a set of recommendations that will benefit Latinas and the entire community of early career scientists. So you can read about this article, uh, in this, about this information in an upcoming article uh, soon to be published. But despite these challenges, you know there is hope. Latinos show great interest and success in science and there have been significant improvements um, of Latinos earning uh, STEM degrees. So it's about 10% now and, is, and continues to be an upward trend. But we can and we must do better to enhance the participation of folks underrepresented in science. Okay, so how did a poor Mexican farm worker kid from a single parent home and impoverished background become a scientist and a professor? Was it sheer luck, innate drive, divine power? I don't know, perhaps it was a bit of all. But it certainly was not easy. There were significant challenges at every step of the way and a lot of struggles that I had to endure. Today I'll tell you a little bit about my academic journey and try to highlight some of those barriers and challenges uh, to provide um, some advice. So education is a gatekeeper, especially in math and sciences. And getting an education for many of us involves leaving home. The transition from home to college is not easy and was a struggle for me. While many young people from our communities have dreams and desires to go to college, it's very hard to leave our families and to live on our own in a different culture that does not include our community as well as our family bonds. So I left home to attend UC Davis, 50 miles away, and I was thrust into a world that was wildly different than what I knew. I didn't feel welcome. I felt uncomfortable, I had no one to help me navigate the system, and I developed insomnia and could not sleep. I struggled academically, I failed freshman calculus, and I wanted to drop out. But I also wanted a better life that college education might offer. So I decided I needed to figure it out and, and to succeed in college, and I did. Four years later, I attended graduate school at UC San Diego. Again, I had a very difficult time adjusting. I felt like I didn't belong, I felt intimidated, and again, I could not sleep. And I had to take my retake my qualifying exam and was considering, seriously considering dropping out. However, I had the opportunity to work in the lab where I experienced success, and that was a very gratifying experience. And I began to develop a science and identity. And at the same time, I became keenly aware that the scientific community was not diverse at all, and there was a paucity of brown and black people. Six years later, I started a postdoc at UC San Francisco, and again, I struggled. I did not feel comfortable, I felt alienated, and developed severe insomnia and could not sleep. The insomnia was physically and mentally debilitating, and I had to seek professional help. At UCSF, I worked along colleagues world-class scientists, and many 
of them were from prestigious elite institutions. They came from very privileged and wealthy backgrounds. However, with success in the lab at UCSF, I began to realize that I was as smart and capable as my peers, despite our very different background and upbringing, and I realized that I was as good, if not a better scientist, than most of my peers, and that gave me confidence. Another experience that gave me confidence and support and will surely give you confidence and support was SACNAS. I attended my first SACNAS conference as a graduate student in the early 1990s, almost 30 years ago, and there were about 30, 200 people at that conference. It was in Te Tempe, Arizona, vastly less than the 6,000 here today. Nonetheless, I was utterly shocked by the number of Chicanos, Latinos, Native and Indigenous scientists that were at the meeting. I met great scientists as well as friends, and many have continued their journey in science and are here today. I also met SACNAS leaders and elders who over the years, these folks have provided me with unwavering support. There is no doubt that SACNAS, the SACNAS community has enabled my success. Let's give a round of applause for SACNAS. So after postdoc training, I then accepted an assistant professor position at a research intensive medical school. Now as a professor in a research intensive uh, institution, I was expected, like my colleagues, to develop a competitive research program, bring in extramural funding, and publish in high profile journals. Yes, I can, and I did that, do that, and so can you. I was also required to teach and train and mentor the next generation of scientists. Yes, I can, and I did do that, and so can you. And to do service comparable to my peers. Well, yes, I can, and I did do that, but I have done far more, far, far more in the area of, than my peers, and so can you. So as a woman, a person of color, there is no doubt that you're gonna be tasked with service far greater than your peers. And early in my career, I na naively believed that as a professor, I'd have the privilege of focus, focusing entirely on my scientific research, publishing, and writing grants. This has not been the case. In this essay, I provide a perspective on the undue burden of service that, that is placed on underrepresented faculty. I reflect on the challenges that faculty of color face trying to maintain a competitive research program while serving the needs of the academy, especially in mentoring and training underrepresented students and postdocs, which we often take on at a greater capacity than our well-represented peers. This article will provide some tips on how to leverage this work. So with success comes responsibility. I see it as my obligation and responsibility as a successful scientist to help young scientists as much I, as I can. Yes, it feels great to walk through the door of success, to land your first faculty or scientist position, to receive, receive your first grant, publish your first high impact paper, but don't let the door shut behind you. It is your responsibility to keep the door open and to bring along as many people as you can. Next, I'll tell you about a couple of initiatives that I've led um, that is goal is to enhance the diversity of the biomedical workforce. So many of these programs really are to increase the success of underrepresented faculty, and that is absolutely key because underrepresented faculty are critical to you, your success. They will serve as mentors, they will serve as role models, and importantly, they will serve as leaders. We need to have our voice at the table. A key to enhancing faculty diversity is to increase the postdoc to faculty transition. San Diego Aracta is a postdoc training program that aims to enhance the diversity of the pro professoriate by expanding training to postdocs from diverse background and, and so that they receive high quality mentorship. The, out, the outcomes of the San Diego Aracta program are really outstanding. We've had many success in, in transitioning folks from underrepresented backgrounds to tenure track positions, particularly at R1 institutions. 
I wish I had an Arachna program to support me when I was a postdoc. Maybe I would have been able to sleep. <laughs> All right. So the presence of faculty who um, bring diverse perspectives uh, into research and teaching um, is uh, critical not only for enhancing excellence in science, but it's also critical to sustain student persistence and success in science. So at UC San Diego, I've led two initiatives to increase faculty diversity. This is just the beginning, but I hope will lead to a change in the inequity that's built into the system. So in 2020, I led a program called the Excellence Search for Diverse Faculty. What we did was re-engineer the traditional department-based process for faculty recruitment. We used extensive outreach using social media platforms and networks, and we designed a holistic review process that considered multiple criteria. We received over 100 applications and significantly high percentage from underrepresented candidates, and we ended up hiring four underrepresented faculty. Now, this may not sound a lot like a lot, but at our institution and at most R1 institutions, it is huge because there are so few underrepresented faculty. In 2020, 2022, I, um, the UCSD received a, a first award to hire 12 assistant professors. <clears throat> These are individuals that have exemplified excellence in research and demonstrated a commitment to inclusive excellence. We use the same re-engineered process and in our first round of recruitment, we received 246 applications with a high percentage from underrepresented candidates. And we hired five underrepresented candidates, and we have two that are pending. In our second round of recruitment, we have received 247 applications, again, with a high percentage from underrepresented uh, candidates, and we're currently recruiting those individuals. So lessons learned. Do not believe the common myth that there are no qualified underrepresented candidate. There is a very large pool of excellent underrepresented candidates with superior credentials that are competitive for faculty positions at all academic institutions, particularly R1 institutions. The second lesson learned is that the standard process for faculty hiring is broken. It's not capturing highly competitive underrepresented candidates, and this is leading to a lack of diversity. So this is very, very hard work, but incredibly rewarding as a member of the scientific uh, community and really offers hope in which we can address this um, inequity. Okay, I can't not speak to you without talking about voting. So I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to vote. Our democracy, our right to control our own personal medical decisions, especially for women, and the funding of science is at stake. Voting is the only way to express your preference, satisfaction, and dissatisfaction with the electorate on how you want to be governed and how you want our tax dollars to be spent. So listen up, millennials, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, your vote counts and we need it. Okay. So here, just a few concluding remarks. Be proactive, be aware, and take advantage of opportunities. For undergrads, there's MARC programs, there's RISE programs, there's SACNA chapters. For graduate students, there's IMSD programs, there's SACNA chapters. For postdocs, there are 21 outstanding ERACTA programs across the country and SACNA chapters. <laughs> Be, build networks, find mentors, senior and near peer mentors, sponsors and coaches. Um, there's the SACNAS initiative to, to mentor, um, to find uh, mentors for you. There's also the National Research Mentoring Network. Help others, pay it forward. Together we are stronger. Say no uh, to service that can be done by others and work on work that is meaningful and impactful for, to you. Be leaders, have hope, Structures are slowly changing, but we need you at the table to change them and vote. And then finally, finally, I'm not exceptional or special in the context of my family or community. I'm like you, but I, like you, have lived my life 
amongst people, our people, who are brilliant, hardworking, community-oriented, and have faced hardship and know how to overcome struggle. I am exceptional in the context of academic science because there are so few of us in, this, in, in academic science. And we need to change that by leveraging all means necessary. You are our future. You are the next generation of scientist leaders. And I wish you all extraordinary success.